Hello and thanks for tuning in. I'm Rixie, one of the content creators here on the Collector's Maze Network. My guest today has worked with all the big name animation studios. He's won two daytime Emmys and is nominated for two Annies uh, for his art direction. He's an incredible artist, designer, and a world explorer. Uh, everyone, Christoph Vosher. Uh, Christoph, uh, welcome to the maze. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time uh, to sit down and talk with us. Uh, I'm excited to hear, you know, about what you, what you've done, what you're what you're doing, and just to learn everything that we can from you. Um, you know, where 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 I love to start, uh, you know, is uh, I love origin stories, right? Um, and I find them. You know, just hearing them, I find you know them just filled with with nuggets, with lessons that, that we all can we all can take to heart and learn, as well as inspiration. So, my my question is, what uh, what are the creative highlights that define your origin story that got you started down this artistic path? Well, um, so I'm I'm originally from France, so um, I you know it was hard to believe like back in the days when I, I had not even entered the industry that I would ever be here today. And, you know, having gone through um, the, I mean, the path I, I went through. Um, so I was like in the middle of France, in the middle of nowhere. I was like from a small town, like really lost in the mountains of France. Um, and there was not even internet. So imagine that, you know, internet didn't exist there was no i mean i didn't know how to use a computer like there you know it was just like the the, the beginning of uh of uh, of internet like a little bit like uh, it was just like the, the the starting point but um it was it was just like not accessible to everyone and and so basically i i was like just drawing and painting on regular paper and you know um regular cardboard or canvas or whatever uh so there was no digital tools none of all this stuff um and so i was lucky enough that so i was passionate about comic books and illustration um and i was lucky enough that i was able to uh, uh show a portfolio one day to um uh a, a producer uh the producer it was a at that time, he was more a di distributor of um, like the first anime series that we had in uh, in France. Um, it was uh, so in France it was called Goldorak, but okay. here I think and, and in Japan it, in Japan it's called Grandizer. Okay. So okay. it was like the Grandizer series, and and he was the first uh, producer in in France to uh, distribute basically that series from Japan. And that was the first anime thing. We had never seen anime before in Europe, like not just in France, in Europe. We had never seen anime before. Actually, yes, we had, but it was not like labeled as anime, really. It was uh, uh, um, the King Leo. It was like this small okay. uh, white lion, you know, that uh, oh, series, okay. you know, in Africa. It was like, it was, it did not even really look like anime. Um, but so that was my first connection to anime really, but like nothing else. So Grandizer was really like what you would uh, qualify as anime at that time, like giant robots basically going at it. And, and that was like my, my first, uh, uh, I mean, my aunt was actually the one who actually, uh, uh turned me towards it. And she said, Hey, you know, you, you're interested in comic books and, and, and animation and illustration. What do you think of that? And then, you know, from one thing leading to the next, eventually I was able to show a portfolio to that, that distributor. And that guy, so he hired me at that time uh, on Ninja Turtles because he was co-producing Ninja Turtles, the very first uh, series, nice. animated series of Ninja Turtles. Um, in, uh, in So he was co-producing co -producing it uh, with the U.S. and and uh, between the U.S., Ireland, and France, so it was a oh, three three partnership, and so that was my very first job. I I uh, started uh, as a I was a designer for uh, secondary characters, and then again one thing one thing leading to the other, 
um, I met like that's how I started to really meet like the artist, the type of artist I wanted to meet, like guys who had been in the in the industry for a while, who were like who had talent, who were like character designers, uh, 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 background designers, uh, painters, uh, and that's really how I started to learn because I, I had done like one year in in fine art school but in france it was just like things were going really really bad oh well, actually it, it hasn't changed much since since that time but it was like basically you wouldn't learn anything like you wouldn't learn how how to draw or paint or you know it was not like something you know it, it was all about modern abstract art you wouldn't you know no real skills needed so um, and I wanted to really learn something more. I wanted to really get s real skills. Um, so, uh, so that's how I really started to learn. Basically, on the job, um, I had with my little baggage, you know, art baggage. I I had some skills that you know got me into the that put put my foot in the door. And that's how I got into animation in the first place. And then. Um, I stayed with nice. this studio for like I think a couple of years, and they they opened another studio in Blois. And so the first the first main studio was in Angoulême, which is like the comic book uh, capital of France, or and even like Europe, um, where everything is about comic books. So that school was there. I mean that studio was there. They also had schools there, um, and and I actually. I started there, but I didn't stay long there because they eventually sent me to a, a new studio they were opening in Blois in, a, you know, like an hour from Paris. And um, so so I continued there. And then eventually after two or three years, I, I decided I, it was time for me to just like start like uh, something fresh, something new. I was eyeing, there was a, a Disney in Paris that had a small studio for, for TV but they were, they had just done a first a feature for TV uh, and they were on their way to, to do a major feature, um, you know, through that studio. And, uh, and it was, uh, at that time it was, a, um, what was it called? Um, uh, 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 uh. It was, in France it was called Dango et, et Max, Dango and Max. Um, uh, here it had another nice. name. Oh, what was the name? Uh, um, <laughs> anyway, it was their <laughs> first feature in France, and and eventually um, uh, it 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 kind of uh, catap catapulted them like to a. It was still financed by TV, so the, the it's intricate the intricate internal structure of Disney mm -hmm. meant that they were still part of TV, and then when Feature saw that. Um, this movie was doing really well. They took over, um, and I don't know exactly, you know, the, the deeper reasons, but they took over that studio, and it became full feature studio for Disney in France. And I was still there, and it was just perfect. So, um, and then we started to do a retraining through a short movie called Runaway Brain, and no one has ever heard of it, but it's a very strange Mickey short movie. Uh, probably the most expensive show that has ever been made, but it, but it was like, it was like we were we retrained on it as full feature quality. So because we didn't understand the difference there was really, but there was a difference between like TV feature and full feature. Yeah, show. yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so there, the quality is different. They, there's more time to do things properly and mm -hmm. all that. Um, and so we were fully retrained, and then uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame came, and so that's when we had okay. our our first uh, very first big feature film. Um, and so I was there for so they, the France the French studio was coordinated coordinated with uh, the American studio, and we made two sequences in France. Uh, I think for a total of about like fifteen minutes, something like that. Um, and and so that was like basically my first uh, big experience with with Disney. And then, think it was like it after the success of Lion King. So that was in the mid nineties, mm -hmm. and Lion King be became a huge success. So uh, every Beautiful studio, film. every big studio, thank you. 
well actually well i didn't work on online thing but like <laughs> thank you anyway for this <laughs> no no but well, it was, and it as, was, and it as was well a... as hunchback i mean both of those were great films yeah, visually visually um, great films so so we 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 continued on that that same uh uh path and um it was at, at the time when they called like the, the that they called the second eight uh, the second golden age of animation uh, mm -hmm. because after the success of Lion King all the big studios wanted to do animation so they were just like going after artists and it, it was really a good time for artists to be around because there were not that many specialized artists and you know studio were ready to put down some money for it so so a lot of people from Disney started to just spread around and like go to other studios and they were renegotiating or they were just slamming the door because they were not happy or uh, but anyway so I wanted to come here uh, to Burbank and so I renegotiated I said hey you know I, I got offers from uh, DreamWorks and uh, mm. uh, Warner was also opening some animation so I just renegotiated and they said, well, okay, so uh, what do you want? So I asked to come to Burbank and I was reassigned to uh, to other projects and I started in Burbank. Uh, so that was in 96 and I started in Burbank nice. on Dinosaur and that was a big, so that was a big thing for me. Dinosaur was the first, you know, feature, a CG animated movie, totally realistic. Um, and and it was like just a, a dream come true you know coming to the to the disney uh, uh feature animated animation studios in 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 burbank in california so so that's how i started in california and then after dinosaur it was um i was supposed to go on tarzan but but in between they needed people to finish fantasia, fantasia 2000 and so so i i um I worked on the last, the very last short of Fantasia 2000, which I absolutely loved. It was the Firebird Suite. So it was very dark, very gothic. It was actually uh, directed by the, the Bridzy brothers, who also were the directors of the sequences that had, of the Hunchback that had been made in France. So they had that sense of like gothic, like very hmm. dark, mysterious, but like very uh, uh, visually impactful. And so, so I kept working uh, with them there on that uh, Firebird suite, and then I I moved over to um, oh I, I before I actually moved to Tarzan uh, I was asked to f to help finish uh, Hercules. So that was a short stint, uh, completely different style, of course. You know, you go from like super serious to like uh, very well, yeah from dinosaurs, which and is then, super realistic, to Tarzan, right? To total yes, different animation styles, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so then I went on to Tarzan, and uh, and then I, I stayed there until until we, we finished it, and then uh, and then finally I worked on Treasure Planet, which I loved, um, oh, nice, which film. I, nice. I think deserved. It it became kind of a cult movie, but but it's mm -hmm. like it never received like a big a big applause when it came out. I I think there was a lot of things happening that just you know did that to the movie and but i i absolutely love the amount of imagination that had been put like people haven't seen a fraction of the research the visual research that had been done on this movie and it was just amazing like the talent i mean it's just like the people who were coming on board were so talented and and it was it was just so inspiring it was a type of science fiction that we had never seen before uh you know based on a completely like like visual style that was borrowing from like 19th century steampunk and steampunk mm. and like piracy yeah. and yep. and like and like full sci-fi and uh, and it was just just amazing and um so i loved working on it and that was my last movie at disney i decided to um so i was working on like paintings for uh, art galleries like what you can see in my back um and so you know i had and i always kind of like led those two careers in parallel and so i was like constantly like you know pulled in one direction and another direction and then finally after treasure planet i thought okay i'll 
I'll give it a try like 100% for, you know, being a painter for galleries. And it was actually working really well. And, uh, you know, it was just, uh, I, I established like a style and, and then it started to sell and, you know, everything was going well. But I started to miss the studio atmosphere, like the, the companionship with our artists and like the, and, the, you know, being in, a, in an environment like animation, there's, a, there's both a competition, a challenge, but also a brotherhood, you know, that, that keeps going uh, with like between artists. And that's really, it's, it, it challenges you, but at the same time, it's like, it's really great. It's inspiring to be around other people who, who, do, who are doing the same thing, who are like really talented. You, you learn a lot and you keep learning, you know, you never stop learning. And so, so I missed that. And then I had the chance to uh, go back into animation with uh, DreamWorks this time on, uh, what was it? Nice. I helped finishing a, it, it was a, a short stint for the Simbad DVD that was, that was coming out at that time. So they were like making a short segment extra. So I helped finishing that out. And then I was hired on um, uh, uh, Flushed Away for, for a short stint too. And then they needed people to help finishing um, Shark Tale. And so, oh, so that's what, so I, I helped finishing Shark Tale and then I left again. Um, and oh, and that's when I decided, so it had been on my mind for a while. I wanted to learn CG and I, I, I felt like I just needed to do it. So I stopped working for like almost two years and I completely like went to school, like the full, you know, full school time, seven hours a day. And I, so I trained on Maya and um uh, and i so, you know i started to play around with other other softwares too like uh, after effects and all that um zbrush so so maya is yeah, animation yeah, software is that animation software and is that that so yeah so if, if it's like it was the standard like mm -hmm. you know 20 years ago it's still the standard in the industry because a lot of studios have built their pipeline around maya but mm -hmm. i would say there's tons of new softwares these days and a lot of people are like there's one in particular that i i use now yeah, it's called blender and blender okay. is awesome because it's constantly evolving so um the only thing is that blender is what they call open source so anybody can come in and basically mm -hmm. write a script for it and studios tend to not like that but there's other reasons there's lots of yeah. things like interacting these days but basically, because it's free, it's entirely free, you can learn the same things as, as you, you have learned in other softwares. Um, but every software has its core strength and, and weaknesses. So, you know, um, ZBrush is still really the top for like people who are like really sculpting with high, high details. Okay. Uh, Maya is, is still relevant because of the pipelines in studios and also because there's a, 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 a their their support department is is really top notch, um, but but Blender is so uh, accessible to so many people and it's just like right there you don't need to pay anything for it you don't need a license you just go for it learn the same things and what Blender has done too is uh, they have fixed a lot of they, it's a mix of like the reason why it's called Blender is basically because it's a it's a mix of other uh, that come from like other softwares, but that they kind of fixed, you know, all the bugs that you could see on other softwares. It, it, it doesn't say that, you know, it's not to say that Blender is perfect, but it, they fixed a lot of things that are, they made it more straightforward. And they also have what they call add-ons, which is like basically uh, extensions um, or plugins um, that you can keep adding up and you, and you just add all these things in, into Blender and, you know, depending on your needs, depending on what you want to explore. And, and for that reason, I, I just really love Blender. So, um, but back then it was Maya. So I, I trained on Maya for almost two years. I came out of the school. I was hired for the first time as an art director on uh, Enchanted. Um, nice. yeah, the, the, the movie Enchanted, the Disney movie. So it was like the 15 minutes of animation that they have in there. 
uh, that I worked on. And, and you know, iron ironically, we didn't do 3D. I, I started to do like research in 3D because I, I was just coming out of 3D. Started to do some research for the castle, for like different things in, in uh, Enchanted. But then eventually, uh, the producers went for, and the director went for uh, a 2D look. So, you know, we went back to traditional 2D. Uh, but at that time, by the way, we, uh, Treasure Planet was the real starting point for uh, CG, a full CG animated movie. So we had had like, I mean, okay, we had Dinosaur, but Dinosaur was kind of a mix of live action and CG. Uh, and it was the look was live action, and then you had you know uh, Tarzan that was using uh, what they called Deep Compass, which was a in-house software that they gave up on because it was just too expensive. And and but we 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 used it for like you know it was like the early days of like uh, um, it was kind of a camera, camera projection on like moving objects, basically more or less. Um, okay. But so. Tar Tarzan was like the very first one to do that, but we did most of the movie using the traditional tools like painting on boards and like uh, drawing on paper and you know scanning that. Treasure Planet was really the first one, the first movie that was full CG. Um, okay. And then so uh, so so after that, you know, basically, and that's also what pushed me in the CG direction. And so it was funny on Enchanted that we all came back to. Um, 2D, but it was still, you know, a full CG animated movie, but it was done like with, you know, Photoshop and like, uh, uh, you know, all, all, everything was still CG. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, but they not, wanted that not, 2D, not that, that old school cartoon feel and not, not a realistic yeah. uh, animation feel, right? So that makes a lot it, of sense exactly. that they would choose 2D on that because it needs to feel like old school Disney, not, you know, not exactly. cur current Pixar. Uh, and and in, in the film, exactly. they basically get shoved out of the animated world into the real world, the characters, right? Uh, in, in, the, exactly. in the movie Enchanted. Uh, and, and that was exactly the, the, the purpose. That was like to show the, the uh, contrast between the full live action world and the, the animated world. And there's even a, a full CG dragon eventually in the movie, in the live action side that, yeah. you know, basically comes out of of the the animation animation side and becomes so and for that purpose they needed like of course a full cg uh animated dragon that looked like live action so wow you wow. know it's like a mix of mix of both um and then i just at the end of enchanting and that was crazy because during enchanted a, a friend of mine was working on the movie nine and i had seen the short there was a short that had been you know that had won um, Academy Awards and I had seen the short and I was like oh my gosh this is amazing like I'd love to work on something like this and then I realized oh my gosh they're making a feature film out of this and a friend of mine very close friend um, is production designer on the movie and I'm like wow this is cool I mean but I'm on Enchanted I mean I you know I know they were looking for people but I was like I'm on Enchanted and then completely out of the blue he called he he sent me an email and he's like hey you know are you free because we're we, our art director just left and we need a new art director and i'm like oh man i'm sorry i'm i'm like i'm i'm still on enchanted we were towards the end but i'm still on it for i don't know how long uh i mean i can't do it and then they came back and they were like well uh we can wait how how long <laughs> nice, do you think you nice. could you could and I'm like, well, I mean, uh, can you wait for like a month? And they're like, we'll wait for three weeks. Uh, and I'm like, ah, okay, I'll, I'll try to make it like, so three weeks later, I'm like, okay, I'm ready, but I need like at least a week, you know, to finish preparing because I, 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 you know, I had all my apartment, all that stuff, you know, it was like moving to Luxembourg because it was being made in Luxembourg at that time. Oh, holy cow. Um, the pre-production the pre-production had been done in uh, Marina del Rey here and then the whole production studio was in Luxembourg and so I had to move to Luxembourg and so I had like basically so they said no we, we, we can't wait for another week you have to be here on Monday and that was Friday <laughs> and I'm like oh my gosh so on Saturday I finished packing anything I could finish packing 
on Sunday I was on the plane. On Monday I was starting working in Luxembourg. That was that was like really insane. That is um, crazy. So yeah, so um, and, so and I started for, working on nine. I was going to say yeah. for people who aren't familiar with nine, uh, um, so that was a, was a Tim Burton production, right? And it's it's a, yeah. a it's a um, Shane kind Acker of a, was directing. Yeah, and it so it's like post apocalyptic. Uh, uh, give us give us a little yeah. backstory. What what what's the story of Nine about? For the people who have not seen Nine, tell right. us what it's about. So, yeah, it, to this day, it's probably like still one of my the favorite projects I worked on. So uh, it's 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 set in a post apocalyptic world, and it's like basically a bunch of small rag dolls that are like being chased by mechanical beasts and they don't know why they don't know where it comes from and they don't know who they are so they're just looking you know for like their their full identity and and it's just a very strange world all humans are dead it's it's pretty dark you know you see like corpses of humans sometimes and you just wonder like what happened and it had this kind of post world war ii feel to it but i'd say world war one world war, world war two like mix um it's like uh you, you had like tones of like uh uh fallen nazism in it yeah but it, it was definitely felt really some nazi, nazi tones in there yeah yeah and so so it was like basically these these uh these ragdolls are like you know moving around and it, they've been created by by someone and they don't know who they're looking for you know that scientist that created them and you know the whole key of the movie is just like that search um and so and it's it's very dark very gothic uh and it was perfect i mean it's totally you know if you look at my painting behind it's like this is like the kind of tone that the movie was going for like you know a lot of light but like in a dark environment and so it was perfect to play with light and it was just like i i just loved it for that and so um it's so a we beautiful on, film on that movie. visually you. beautiful it's, visually it, beautiful i mean, I mean I mean that that uh, without was, a doubt, it, the realism and the the believability of the characters and just and the 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 design of the characters. I mean, you mentioned the rag doll; they're like little burlap sacks with with these eyes mm-hmm. that that you know uh, that. And, and there's a there's a little there's some cut scenes at the beginning of him creating you know nine I think it is the actual you know the number nine doll yeah. and uh, it's just. Uh, beautifully directed, uh, you know, beautifully drawn. So, I mean, I see why and, uh, and, uh, you actually, guys were nominated on that. The, the the original project was based on a on a short that had been done by the director Shane Acker, and and it's his project. It's, it was like his baby, and so he was a he was a Maya instructor at UCLA, and basically he was doing that on on the side, like the the short on on the side. And so it, it's his whole world, his whole creation. And basically, you know, um, he, he met a, a guy, I can't remember his name, who connected him to Tim Burton. And all these people eventually became like producers on, on, the, on the movie. And Shane uh, left UCLA at least for a while to just um, go on to make that, that crazy feature film. And like he says often, um, we made that movie for like, with like duct tape and shoestrings. I mean, literally, we had, there, there was no money. There was like basically, um, and you can tell in, because we ran into so many problems. Right. And we ran into so many problems uh, that even the, eventually they ran out of money. The, the story was shortened. You know, we didn't have time and money anymore. So basically everything came to a, a short you you feel that in the story it, it's a short it's a fairly short feature film should have been longer um but eventually we didn't have the the resources anymore um and it is what it is but it became a cult movie and for what it is i still love this movie it it, it has so much soul and we all felt that way and we we still all love that movie um and so so that movie kind of like you know, crashed in Luxembourg, unfortunately. So they moved it to um, uh, Canada, to- Toronto. Um, at, what was it? The Stars Studio, I think, um, who had just finished a feature film. They were ready to basically find a, a new feature film to make. So it was finished there at, at that studio. And I didn't really 
want to move to Toronto. I was like, at that point, I was kind of tired of like, you know, just like not being sure of anything. So the producer, the funny part, she was setting up a, stu a new studio in Pasadena, a small studio uh, 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 helmed by uh, uh, Ken Duncan, who was a Disney veteran. Okay. And, and Ken was like one of the first animators at Disney to have been interested in CG and, and 3D. And so he wanted to open his own studio, which he did. Uh, and she was helping setting that up. And, and it was perfect timing because basically he was offered to do 15 minutes on, on that movie. So she said, she said, hey, you know, why don't you go to Ken Duncan's studio so you're there, we're all working together, you know, between Pasadena and Toronto, and you can do, you know, we, you know, we, we were communicating through internet and you would do travel, you know, a, a few times between Toronto and Pasadena. And that's, that's what I did basically. Um, and that's how we finished the film. And even the, the end was like, uh, there were so many uncertainties, but eventually it was finished and it was re released in uh, uh, on September, you know, nine 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 nine. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Basically, yeah, very, so, very, very clever. So was, use, was, you know, you got to do yeah. that, right? I mean, you got to do we, that for that film. I, it's like you know, it was a coincidence because they sat on that movie for like about a year, I think, and finally, yeah, because it was it was. Finished, so they didn't plan that. They, so it came they, out. I mean, it literally, that no. was just where it fell. It was like we we, you know, they had finished what they had. And then they were like, "Hey, you know, we're being, we're getting close to 2009. Why don't we just wait?" So they waited for, you know, nine okay. nine 2009 to nine, release nine, the, the film. It, perfect, it's it's perfect. too bad the, the the they I think I mean it's a personal opinion, but I think a lot of people share that opinion. They didn't push the movie as they were supposed to, and they realized that too late, at, right after it came out. Uh, because it, it was uh, in the first 10 movies um, when it came out the first week. And then because they hadn't pushed it enough, they realized, oh, my gosh, we made a mistake. And they tried to advertise it some more afterwards. And it was too late. It was like basically it, it was just they made the same mistake with Iron Giant. Iron oh, Giant oh. that became also a cult, cult yeah, animated movie. Super so film. the same happened with Nine. Now, now yeah. same, so, so same same uh, company as Iron Giant or different, just just similar stories, as far as lacked uh, marketing. Uh, so uh, no, so I think I think um, uh, Iron Giant was uh, Warner, and okay. and okay. Um, and Nine was actually Focus Features, which was like the independent okay. uh, uh, branch of Disney. Well, oh, of, uh, sorry, uh, Universal Studios. The good news is that uh, it, it does live on in, in streaming. Uh, it, it's available on Amazon. And yeah. for, for any listeners who have not seen it, uh, I mean, you know, it's by no means, a kid, I don't think it's a kin film. This, this is, you know, uh, because it, it, it is right. dark, you know, it is, it is, uh, yeah. but it, yeah. it's, it it's can a, be fr pretty frightening at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it's, it's visually stunning. Uh, it, it's, it's moving uh, that, that opening, um, uh, that opening scene, you know, after after he leaves, after Nine leaves the, you know, jumps out the window and goes down and, and first encounters the beast. And then uh, I forget, uh, it's two. Yes. It's, it's two that he encounters. And that scene where, right. where two, um, uh, I don't want to give away too much, but where two basically sacrifices himself for Nine. It's like, oh, you know, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Right. You know, right there, right yeah. there. Uh, so, uh, but. Yeah. Uh, if you've not seen it, get out and watch it. it it's it's a great movie and it's very I, unique, very unique. Yeah, you can see why you know it deserved the nominations. So you, know, you were art director on that, is that correct? So I mean, that was your official title on right. the, on the film. So right. I, I'm I know a, a little, and I have an idea what what that role entails. But kind of kind of explain for us what what are the responsibilities of an art director on an animated film. So, and that's actually a really good question because it really depends on the studio and it depends on the project. Okay. So, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion happening between, be, because of that, because the role can change from the project to the studio. Um, so let's say until now, well, like, 
games kind of changed that a bit, but like basically in the traditional animation an, animation world, uh, on TV in TV usually the art director does everything, like uh, all the design part. So like uh, you know he, he covers like uh, he or she uh, covers uh, the the character design, the the environment design, the the color keys and the the, the color script. Okay, and then all it, all this is like visual development basically, and then. Um, he gives that to the, the CG team or like the rest of the, the production and then that is um, uh, turned into the, the final uh, product. On uh, feature films, usually it's a little different. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's still kind of the same today, but it did some, some, sometimes studios do things differently. So it would be like the production designer so there can be two art directors, one more in charge of design, the other one more in charge of okay. like uh, lighting, lighting and I mean, lighting design and, and color script slash color keys, which is kind of all the same thing. Um, so and the two would work together. So uh, either two directors, two art directors, sorry, or a production designer and an art director and the production designer would the same thing would do all the design aspect, um, you know, like uh, working. And usually they have a specialized character designer, which usually they don't have in TV, but it depends on the project again. Um, mm -hmm. And so they would have like a, um, a, a, a character designer working directly with them, but they would be in charge of like uh, all the all the design. So uh, the production designer supervises not just character design, but environment designs. And he works alongside with an art director who is in charge of like all the the uh, painting color keys and color script to design the lighting of the show. Okay. And and usually like they both look at eventually post in post production when everything has been done, and you have like color correction and like all that stuff that comes afterwards. Uh, they still keep an eye on that eventually uh, with the director. To make sure that the original look that we started from is still what we get, or as close as as we can uh, at at the end. Nice. And and so video games have changed that in the way that uh, video games tend to have an art director for everything. But again, it depends on the studio. Uh, I think because if you want high quality. And that's, you know, that's my personal opinion, but I think a lot of people share that. Um, if you want high quality, you have to have someone specialized. And it doesn't mean that they can't do other things, but, but mm -hmm. you know, that's why you have a production designer who, because at high quality level, you want to have several looks at one type of design and like asking for corrections, you know, and so there's lots, it's, you know, the devil is in the detail, and that's exactly what it is here. It's like, basically, you have to come, like, there's so much to, to look at, eventually, if you want high-level quality, that it's asking for one person to be supervising everything. It's just crazy. And I think a lot of uh, um, uh, video games have understood that, but, like, and it depends on the, 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 the quality level you want. If you want, like, uh, um, live action type style look mm -hmm. this is like a lot to do for for one person if you want something more stylized that's a different story you, you know you could you, you know there's a leeway between the, those two so and i think since the video game industry started and they they revolutionized everything because basically now we start seeing like uh, you know people from game um, coming into animation, it used to be the other way around because there was okay. no one in the gaming industry that was really trained to do that. So they, they started to pluck people from uh, live action and and and, um, and animation to start like shaping them into what they needed. So today we have a real well trained you know uh, 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 population of artists in the video game industry who are like really talented. And they start like coming into, you know, back into like uh, VFX, animation, all that. So it's changing the whole game. And also you have new software, like I'm talking specifically about like, well, of, of course, Blender, but also Unreal Engine, 
that has mm, yeah. that is changing the field. Unreal Engine is just like um, it's completely revolu revolutionizing again, you know, the, the field because it's like basically you can have for free like a whole bunch of really realistic looking stuff and you can do a lot within unreal engine to change the look of things and and all this was impossible you know before now so so there's a lot of change you know the animation went from like no change for like a century and then suddenly boom the cg industry starts and it changes everything and it's still changing today uh so there's lo lots of moving parts um to the point that artists actually don't really necessarily know what to learn first because they're yep. confused. They're like, oh, should I, do, what should I start with? Like, should I learn the principles first or the tools first? Uh, should I learn Photoshop or like, should I learn Maya or Blender or Unreal Engine or like Modo or like ZBrush? There's a lot of confusion about that. And that's kind of like, you know, um, I, I talk a lot about that too because uh, People ask me a lot of questions about that, so I have answers yeah, that, for that too. That, that that's 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 one of my questions. We might as well cover it while we're here. I mean, where someone's starting out, I mean, um, do do is it better to start, you know, practical with a physical medium, you know, pencil, paper? I mean, or do they go straight? I guess it depends on their goal, their end goal, really. But I mean, I guess right. you got to be ready for everything though, because you don't you don't know what's going to come your way. You don't know what you're going to walk exactly. into. So where, if, you, if you were to start I, over, where, where, where would you think you would start? So the, to me, the and I, I think a lot of people are, you know, I, I, as experience goes, mm -hmm. a lot of people are realizing this is true. Uh, you, need, uh, you need to start at the foundation. Drawing on paper, painting, no matter if you paint on, in Photoshop or like, I mean, even people who paint in Photoshop, you know, or like any other, you know, procreate or whatever, mm -hmm. eventually they realize it's also great painting on real canvas because there's another tactile sensation. Like mm -hmm. you can't replace that. No mm -hmm. matter how good you are at painting in Photoshop or like, and, and there's real talent out there, a lot of amazing artists out there. But when they, when they start painting with real paint, well, it's kind of, a, you know, a little chaotic first because when they're not used to it, like, those new tools are kind of like, you know, um, not the same. Uh, but when you get a hang of it, the tactile feeling is completely different. And it's just like, so the reason why I'm still painting on canvas is just like, because there's no, there's nothing that replaces that when you paint on, mm. on a Cintiq tablet, you know, even like with all the best uh, graphic uh, tools you can have, the best pens you can have. I mean, don't get me wrong. They made tons of progress over the yes. past 20, 30 years. And it's and I love painting on a graphic tablet. But what you get on a canvas is not even replaceable. It's just like and also the there's a, a personal experience when you're in front of a layered real painting that you cannot replace with a computer in a computer. When you paint on a graphic tablet, you will always be behind a window. And it's like a digital image. There's nothing else. Uh, it's very, very practical. That's what we loved about Photoshop and even all the new tools now. It's so practical. You control every single aspect of your creation. But on a canvas, well, first of all, you're you're more challenged because it's like there's no undo button. <laughs> you know, you have to do it right the first time. Yeah. And that's like where your real focus and talent shows you know um and your training like if you have trained hours after hours without a, an undo button you will see the difference and so that that to me and pencil on paper i love it it's just like you still do that like uh it's not comparable it's like the that that feeling of like you know charcoal and or, or pencil on, on the paper you 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 can't change that so so I would say no matter what, whether you paint digital or draw digital or, or traditional, uh, start with the foundations. Once you have those foundations and you, under, you need to understand, because the principles are the same, you still need to understand how design works, the research of shapes, composition, uh, how color works, how lighting works in the, the real world. Why, you know, bouncing light, what, what is that? How cinematic, cin cinematographic uh, lighting works? 
Why does it work that way? What is three point lighting? Uh, mm -hmm. All this stuff uh, you, you need to learn in order to be a good artist, whether you're traditional or digital. And then uh, getting into 3D software is more like being a, be a, being a sculptor. So if you, I know okay. some of my artist friends who, who do both real sculpting, like in real life, and also software sculpting. So it's you know two different tools, but same principles. So the principles are the main foundation, no matter the tools. Um, that makes you know, sense. principles of design, composition, like all that, all, all these things. And there's the ramping up of, there's like a learning curve. So it's like, you know, from the point to the line, to the, the flat shapes, composition of flat shapes, uh, depth, you know, the four ma major uh, principles of composition, and then move from that to uh, the composition of 3D shapes, three dimensional shapes. Uh, how you work with them, like moving them around in three dimensions or on paper. They can still be three dimensions on a flat paper. Um, and then uh, understanding lighting, because that's part of composition. Lighting in black and white first. And then from lighting, understanding how uh, color works and how it works with lighting. And then eventually texture. And so all this is like is a long learning curve that we have completely forgotten in, 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 in art, in art schools in general, not, mm -hmm. not specialized art schools. The funny part is that gaming art schools are the ones bringing back those principles because they have to. But in traditional art schools, none of this is taught anymore. It's just ridiculous. Uh, in Europe, we have lost all this uh, other than, you know, in applied arts or, or uh, video game schools. Uh, in traditional schools for art, you don't have that anymore. And just, it's just a, a shame. So, so hopefully we can bring all these things back because people want to learn how to draw, how to paint. Um, abstract and modern art. It, it's, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about abstract and modern art. It's part of that same learning curve. But what is abstract? What is modern art? It's playing with the same principles on at the very beginning of the learning curve it's flat shapes you know abstract what is it flat shapes with like what we call lost and found edges you know sharp and smooth edges um in a in a composed environment that's what it is uh, other than that of course you can talk about ideas all all day long you can write entire books about ideas that's a different story but if you produce an a, a, a a piece of art you have to make it become physical at some point how do you do that by learning principles so you there's two things in art. there's like the ideas the themes and then there's like a physicality of it and so i think we're bringing back all the how to make that physicality happen these days and people want to learn all this they want to learn all these these painters from the 19th century who were like so good at what they were doing so that's to me that's the learning curve and then you, you get into new tools you know even unreal engine when you work in unreal engine you need to understand what makes a good composition what makes a good lighting what um sets are good to work with what characters or or, or props are great to uh, match together all that stuff is it's still borrowing from the same foundations so same principle. So really, you know, starting at, at, at you know, with, with the physical medium, the, the, the charcoal, the pencil, the paper, I mean, and learning those foundations, those principles is, is where you would steer someone first. And then the software piece of it, I mean, that's just another tool. It's just a different medium that, that once you learn the, exactly. intric it, the intricacies of the medium, you're applying the same principles. You just got to learn how to apply them using that medium. So I love that. Exactly. That's, and that's, you just, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's so great. The, 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 the principles of design and principles of nature never change because design is part of nature. So all these principles never change. You cannot change them. You can, you can go in all directions. You can like, you know, go crazy trying to change them. You will not change them because they are there as a, a point of reference in nature that nature uses to create, to create what we see around us. Uh, what we see, like all this comes from design and, and, you know, 
what, what pleases the eye. And we kind of enhance that through a painting, through a, photog a photograph, through a movie. We kind of just take all these principles from nature and just we just reassemble them and we kind of enhance the, the, the pleasure that you get from, from looking at them in nature. That's great information. So you, you, uh, you touched on something that reminded me, a question I wanted to ask you. So uh, I noticed, I mean, you get a lot of inspiration from travel. Uh, so in, uh, I'm assuming you're, right. taking, you're taking a lot of photographs. How, 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 are you, oh, uh, yeah. how, how are you organizing those? How are you keeping those so that you can, you can, I mean, do you just, you know, find the inspiration then and then, you know, go to it right then and there? Or do you have those cataloged? Or what are you doing with right. all those photographs? I'm curious. I mean, basically, you, you just kind of know, like you kind of remember. Well, okay. sometimes you, you don't remember, but when you go back to your folders, you, you know you went to that country or that country, and then you, you just kind of remember where you went. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, or sometimes you just revisit your folders and you're like, oh, what did I see in that country? And then you start rediscovering your, your photos and you're like, oh. And sometimes, you know, inspiration, you never know when it strikes. So it's like, Sometimes you look at a picture and suddenly you see it in a different way th that, than you had seen it like when you took it or, or when you, you put it in a folder. And then it gives you, and also depending on your uh, experiences after that time, you, you suddenly you, you start putting things in a different context mentally. And then that picture gives you suddenly a completely different feeling. And then you, you see something that inspires you in that image. And then you start you start like applying it in a probably in a different context or maybe in that completely uh, same context. Like for instance, uh, uh, there's a Grand Canyon painting that I did um, uh, fairly recently that was part of the the image that I took uh, visiting the Grand Canyon. Okay. And I, you know, basically I rearranged a few things in Photoshop. Uh, and I introduced a character and like a floating stone and like something a little surreal. Um, and that was, you know, and suddenly this image like became like really like, uh, uh, well, it's actually for the anecdote is going, the, the dig digital version is going to the moon. Um, we like, um, yeah, there's like a, the Polaris collection of, of artworks because uh, it, it, it was part of the winners of a of a, one of the top uh, um, art exhibitions for figurative art in the world, ARC, in New York. And all the winners have been picked to be part of the Polaris collection of uh, works of art that, are, that is going to the moon. Um, there's four collections that are going to the moon. Um, and that one is, uh, I think, the last one. It has been postponed. It was supposed to leave in November of this year. And I think it's That's postponed so cool. to February of the year after. And so, yes, yeah, so it's like uh, the same thing they had done with Voyager Vo Voyager 1, like with the golden disc yeah, yeah. engraved with like all the, the yeah, yeah. you know, human science and all that. So they're doing the same, but like with a much vaster uh, load of, of works, human works. Um, and there's like all kinds of uh, works uh, and artworks um, in all categories, like... Uh, you know, photography, film, music, poetry, literature, uh, painting, of course. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's, that painting was, uh, I, you know, ironically part of that. And, uh, and it, it was based on one of the, the uh, trips to Grand Canyon. So Grand Canyon, so, so a picture that you took at the Grand Canyon became a, a piece of art that is now, so is that on, is that, probe or whatever left or is that still to go uh, so it's still to go like i was saying it was supposed to go this year uh, in november and because of all the, the problems they had uh, you probably followed that on the news uh with their missions to the moon yep. um it, it's been postponed to uh, uh february of of uh, next year next year so so, so hope, hopefully so you... So a piece, a piece of your artwork will will potentially be on the moon next year. <laughs> yeah, that, that is such crazy such an honor. I mean, uh, I'm totally yeah, excited. I'll have to keep, I'll have to keep an eye on that in the news. I I think I'd remember catching a piece of that, so I will definitely keep an eye on that. What um, so where I mean, uh, I found your website, and let's let's remind everyone, give us your web address where we where people can find and and see your artwork. Uh, what's that address? So so the 
my so my main address is Vache Art Space. So V A C H E R uh, Art Space um, yeah. dot com. Uh, but um, I have a, another one that I use, like because that one art space is is more like uh, where I put everything. Like uh, so, it has different sections, and I put basically everything there. Um, now I have a one that I use more for pro professional purpose, and it's ArtStation. I mean, okay. it's you know on ArtStation, the the the, the big uh, big uh, hub for artists. Uh, okay. Uh, the art station, and so if you search for my name there, you'll, you'll find my, my page on on Art Station. I'll have to look Art Station up. I I've not I've not ventured there yet, so I want I want to find I want to find that venture there. It, um, I did I catch, and I've got to know because I, I do not have enough Star Wars in my life. Did I catch somewhere that that you're working on some? Uh, now are these these so, uh, art yeah. paintings? Yeah. Are, so, what so, are these? So they are like so. Uh, the Star Wars franchise has a uh, limited edition branch that they it's called Acme uh, Acme Archives, and so that branch is specialized in making limited editions of uh, Star Wars images. Um, and so one day they contacted me and they asked me, "Hey, would you be interested in doing some imagery for Star Wars?" And I was like, <laughs> "Break my it's yeah. like twist my arm." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Like, wait of a minute, course wait not. A minute. Of course, yeah. I'm not interested. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Click. <laughs> uh, so, so my first one was on Princess Leia. Um, the the interesting part is that uh, so when I actually uh, submitted my first project on Princess Princess Leia, I didn't realize that they were. They were asking for something very specific to one movie or one episode mm -hmm. that was already out there, and so I completely like disregarded that. I I didn't re realize that, and I did something that was completely different, but still based on yeah, Le yeah. the Leia character, and so it's called uh, "Until Our Last Breath," uh -huh. and basically it was like portraying Leia as a um, so she's she's in that in that time when she was training as a Jedi, but she was not a Jedi. And she basically, I imagine her like having to choose a path between becoming a full Jedi or becoming a general, which eventually mm -hmm. she chooses. Um, and in that image, I, so she's portrayed with like, I mean, clothes you, you've never seen before, but I, I wanted to have some kind of like epic, you know, she's wearing a cape, like a kind of a mantle that looks like a cape. And she's wearing all white, of course, and, and she has a, a lightsaber, a blue lightsaber. Um, and you see in the distance, so she's in a, a polar environment, like her original planet. And in the distance, you see a star destroyer destroyer coming mm. through the clouds. And basically, it was like the the re re the renaissance of the of the empire, or like you know, at least like the remnants of the empire, like res resurging. And I imagine her basically having to choose or deciding to choose for her people to, for the sake of protecting her people to become a general instead of a Jedi. And so and when when the, the brand saw that, they were like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? It's like, I mean, the, the people at, at Acme were like, oh, my gosh, it's like, uh, you know, it's like they were not sure. And they sent it to uh, the Star Wars, you know, execs. And they were like, huh, that's interesting. What was the base, the, the base uh, thought on that? Like what? And so I explained, I was like, this is, I imagine her like being there and like deciding to, at that point in time to just uh, go in that direction. And that's why it's called until our last breath, because basically we're going to fight until we die. And, and so I was like, um, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you guys wanted something. And and eventually they were like, no, that's cool. You do that. And so the the guy at Acme Archives were like, oh, we cannot believe they accepted the, your image. So that's a, a very unique image out of uh, you know any other one because that's that won't happen again. After that they were like, no, you follow you follow like. What's I love the story behind already. that. I love the story. So behind. so I done. Uh, after that one, I, I did so, and that one was digital, 
the next one I did was Ahsoka, and and I I started I started to do it on canvas because I realized mm -hmm. so there's also a market for canvas work original canvas work, um, and as an artist you are not authorized to do anything anything else with the image itself but you're allowed to sell the original with uh, after first sight from uh, george lucas mm -hmm. so if he doesn't buy the, the original then you're allowed to sell it somewhere else and so i started to do that with ahsoka uh, which has been published and and now i'm working on the mandalorian uh, and the the mandalorian so i have an image now that ha has been approved uh, so i need to just paint it <laughs> Uh, like uh, the, I did the sketches and, and I, I just need to paint it now. And so and that will be a canvas of the Mandalorian? So that will be on, on, on canvas, yeah. On canvas. And oh, so, wow. I mean, eventually the, the, the limited edition doesn't show whether it's on canvas or, or if it's digital. Um, but eventually I'll have, you know, actually uh, I have the original here of the, the Ahsoka uh, painting. Can we see it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh, that is gorgeous, Christoph. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. I love. It. If if you can't tell, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. Um, and when I when I saw that on your, I was like, <laughs> oh, I, I've got I've got to know what you're what you're doing. At first, when I saw the one behind you, I'm like, because the the red glinting off the blade, I'm like, is that is yes. that a, is that a Sith back there behind you? You know, is that a is that a you know a Dark Lord? But and it would make a totally no, cool it's, one. It, it's, 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 it's actually interesting because uh, I, I actually didn't think of Star Wars making that one. But then because it's very symbolic, it's like about uh, uh, integrity, like, you know, the symbol of integrity. And and so I didn't think of Star Wars at all. But once it was finished, I was like, wait a minute, this looks like Star Wars. I mean, <laughs> it, it kind of looks like it has a Star Wars feel to it. Yeah, but it's it's medieval it's like a, you know i used uh, that's another type of reference i, I used I, I go to um renaissance fairs mm -hmm. you know for medieval reenactments and there's lots of reference to take pictures from so i, I do that a lot and um and it's it's great because uh, it gives me free medieval reference right there mm, i love that i, I love yeah I, I, the ahsoka is gorgeous the, the now the painting behind you what is it does that have a name what's that called so I was saying that it's regarding integrity. So it's it's called the price of integrity. The so price it's like, of and integrity. And it represents basically. It represents like it the the sword represents basically the pain that you have to go through sometimes if you want to keep integrity. Um, and like you know the, the the courage and the pain you you have to go through. Uh, and I I thought it was interesting. I, I want to get into. I don't want to get into political debate here but basically in politics i feel like there's not enough integrity these days especially these days um i see people flip-flopping all the time and and it's about integrity in general it's like what what your core beliefs are and what you're ready to stand for and not flip-flopping from one day to the other um and so so i decided to just do a painting on that i love that I love I love the thought and meaning in your work and I, so the the Leia uh, you mentioned that's a digital print I mean is that is that available f for for you know can people purchase that somewhere or was that a limited you know yeah so uh, so there's two websites where you can uh, so uh, the Leia one uh, I think it went out of print but they reprinted it for like the they had recently like uh, an anniversary of uh, Star Wars for I think it was like uh, I can't remember how many years of Star Wars, but so in London, so they had a big celebration, and for that occasion, they reprinted uh, the the Leia print because it was very successful, and so they have a different size, um, and uh, I don't know about the support, uh, but but it was like um, it was just like a, a reprint basically, um, and it's been really successful. So. Um, so, so yeah, so, uh, Star Wars, I, I'm still like, you know, doing new ones. The, 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 the Ahsoka one, I, I'm not sure like how successful it's been. Um, but I, I, you know, it's like it, 
it's a slow thing anyway because they are yeah. limited edition prints. So, so the websites, yes. So, um, one is Acme Archives. So, a Acme is like uh, I think it's A C M E okay. Archives. Um, dot com, and there's also Dark Ink. Dark Ink. Uh, that's the kind of a new one. It's Dark Ink. Okay. Uh, I think it's dot dot com also. And so th these are officially licensed yeah. Lucasfilm. Uh, so they're distributing, you know, officially licensed uh, limited edition prints. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and your prints. So the Ahsoka one will be up both there. Like, yeah. So they and they have uh, both. So uh, both on paper and on canvas. Uh, so I don't know what's. I know that the, the 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 one on paper for Leia had been out of print and I think that's the one they reprinted at a different format but you, you, you'll, you'll see on the website if you go to the website and then there's, there's also like on the official uh, Star Wars website okay. they had when that came out when that print of Leia came out there was a big article uh, when, that they basically they sent me a whole questionnaire like uh, where I explained all this so it's a long article about the making of of the, that Leia print, I, I love the meaning you know behind it. That that will be the one I'm going to look for. I'm definitely going to go out and look for the Leia because I love, I love the thought you put into what you wanted to put on the canvas and that that it was you know, uh, you know her, um, you know her decision you know whether to to, to follow the path of the Jedi or uh, you know go the path of the the politician turn turn general. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see that one after hearing about it. So, um, cool. you know, you've got the, the, the art station, you've got your website. I encourage everyone to get out there and look for it. Y any Instagram or anything like that, that that people can follow and see? I mean, yeah. You know, what, uh, what's your Instagram? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's either C. Vache or C. H. Vache. I can never remember. But okay. if you look for my name, Christophe Vache, you'll, you'll, you'll find me on Instagram. And okay. then... Uh, uh, yeah, Facebook. Uh, Facebook. I have two accounts. Um, one is more like the professional account, but it's like it, usually people contact me on Facebook through my regular one, which is kind of like so I never know which one. I mean, my my regular uh, account is is fine too, but I'm reaching like the limit of friends yeah. I can have. So. So like you know, there's only so many people I can like you know. You can never have 5, too many 000. friends, <laughs> unless they're <laughs> unless they're Facebook but, friends. <laughs> so so just so people know, it's like you can only uh, eventually on 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 Facebook. It's like I might be able to uh, uh, add people as friends, but usually if I don't respond, it's like you know you, you automatically you're putting the following. Um, uh, section so um, but because I'm, I'm like reaching the at some point I had to just like cut cut because some people like sometimes yeah. contact you they have no they just want to connect with someone on Facebook and they have no interest in like what you're doing sure. or, or yeah. like who you are or whatever sometimes so, you gotta prove so I had to cut down like a exactly you gotta prove so that's what I did so I reduced down because it was reaching like really I was getting close to 5,000 and it was just untainable. So well, yeah, and then, um, then your, so now, your feed is a mess, and you, you don't know what you're looking at half the time. Exactly. So, so now now it's uh, it's lower than five thousand, but it's 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 mounting again. It's like so I have to just watch that. It's too, time so. to prune again. So I have to know what um, <laughs> what is the what's the comic book. I mean, so I'm assuming you didn't have internet, uh, you know, back in, in the early days in the small village in, in, in France. I mean, what, what was the comic book that, that, that just, you, you know, you loved that you read, you know, day in, day out? What was that comic book? So it actually, it evolved over time because in my, you know, when, when I was a kid, before even knowing how to write, I was already a big fan of comic books. And the one comic book that, you know, started to, you know, uh, get my attention was Tintin. Tintin, uh, okay. You know, so you, you remember Tintin? Like, uh, most people have forgotten about Tintin. Yeah, like vaguely, yeah. Spielberg, you know, Spielberg got, you know, people back into it with the movie like a few years ago. Um, but 
you know, you ask people today, like the young generation, most of them don't know what Tintin is. And Tintin was massively huge, like in, well, in Europe first, but like for, for uh, uh, at least a generation, um, and it came here. And, and Spielberg was like actually one of the people who actually kind of like refreshed it in a way. Um, and Tintin, you know, goes into all countries. He goes on the moon and like, um, it was like basically for teenagers of that time, you know, like it was teenager adventures. Tintin is like 15, he's a reporter. Um, he's a journalist and goes into those crazy adventures. Uh, and he goes to America at some point and becomes a cowboy. Yeah, it's like you know, there's all these these stories, um, and there's it's pretty serious. It's like it's not you know, it's like for kids, but like it's still pretty serious. And and uh, so I was I was fascinated by this. And before, so I was five before I even knew how to write. My mom was teaching me how to write, and I was I couldn't care less. I I was drawing, you know, okay. uh, sketches of Tintin on the side. Well, that was my first big love, and then and then uh, things evolved, and I I got into um, uh, uh, Mobius, all the Mobius. Okay, uh, Mobius. Okay. So and Mobius, you know, when it's you a little, know Mobius, it's a little darker, like, you're right? So so Mobius is like it's more like psychedelic, but yeah, okay. Sci-fi. So there's there's the Arzak, and there's like all the sci-fi stuff that is like kind of. Um, surreal kind of sci-fi and then he's got his second personality as a, a different different uh, uh, drawing style when he was uh, making cowboy stories with Blueberry so and oh, many okay. people don't know that Mobius, Mobius and, and, and uh, Jean Giraud that's his real name Jean Giraud he was drawing Blueberry as Jean Giraud he was doing all the crazy stuff as Mobius. Okay. And so he's got two styles and he was really fast at, at, at drawing. So he, he, he made many uh, comic books and his main style, the one I loved was like his style as Mobius. And that's what got me into uh, science fiction. Uh, and he worked on Tron, the original Tron oh, okay. movie. You know, he, he was hired by Disney to come to the US because he's French. He originally, he's, well, he was French. He, he died a few years ago. Yeah. Um, um, he's got a very interesting story. Like uh, he, uh, I read about it, and it's like he lived in Mexico with his mom for a while, um, and that's what all this cowboy stuff came from. Like he traveled to Cal California, and just eventually, uh, you know, went back to France, lived lived most of his life in France, and and then eventually one of his last, uh, after his last trip here. Um, the Creative Talent Network uh, were doing like CTN Expo uh, animation. I invited him uh, just a couple of years, less than a year before he died. So that was a that, that was a very interesting coincidence that they invited him, like basically where he was uh, familiar as he grew up. Um, uh, you know, close to uh, he was. I think he was like kind of. Uh, traveling between Mexico and and, and California, mm -hmm. and uh, so he came to California, and then uh, he went back to France, and that was it. But so he was like a major in inspiration for me uh, in my teenage years, and then after that, I got more into painting. So I was more, more into Frank Frazetta, Boris Vallejo, like all these guys who were like doing all this fantasy illustration stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, eventually, you know, I got to, I did, I never got to meet, um, Frank Frazetta, uh, cause unfortunately he's passed away too. Um, but I got to meet, uh, Boris several times, um, cause we, we participate in the same show, like every year on the East coast, um, the, uh, um, IX arts show. Um, so, so yeah. Um, nice, nice. And, uh. And so I became more of a painter and then I was interested in animation and I got that chance, like that one chance in a lifetime to show my portfolio at, to, to this guy in France. Uh, and that just, just bloomed like, into bounced, all this, you know, all this, you, you went, yeah, just you went crazy, from, crazy. from, from 10, 10 to, to, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to, uh, we didn't even touch on, uh, you know, Transformers, uh, 
we all, oh, yes. we almost need That's to do right. we almost need to do a follow up but you know transformers uh, i mean I, I love i love your story i love that i mean it was just you know from from 1010 comic books that, that led you down this this path and i love hearing those because you know and I, I know i draw inspiration from it it's like you know it's just it's just getting in there and doing the work and being creative and not being afraid to take those you know, to take those steps showing the portfolio to, to someone you know through the animation or the anime house there in uh, uh, France you know when you had the opportunity so I love that I love that uh, right. wonderful well yeah, uh, I think for, for 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 every for I'd say for all the young generation like don't miss your opportunities when you have them when yeah. when they present themselves to you exactly be 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 aware be aware of like what level you're at and train as much as you you can and as hard as you can to reach uh the level you you want to reach and then and then just recognize those opportunities when they come yeah so so it's 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 preparation and and opportunity right i mean so you got to be prepared to be and yeah. uh it was a previous guest that I love. Uh, he'd, he'd written his book, and he goes, "Luck is when preparation meets opportunity." Is what luck is. Absolutely. And it's so you I mean, I, exactly. you've got to be doing the work. You've got to be drawing, working, you know, being prepared so that when you, you you are met, you know, when you meet an opportunity, you can step right into it. And you, you, my friend, exactly. have absolutely done that. I mean, uh, what an amazing uh, you. career you've led and continue to lead. Um, so thank you so oh, much for, you. for for the time. Uh, I've enjoyed it. I'm, I feel like we, we could probably talk for another hour easily. Uh, oh. I've got I mean <laughs> I've got so many other that I didn't even didn't even touch on. But um, I love your stories and and I love your creativity. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, have a wonderful wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you.